What the Lord requires of thee? What the Lord requires of thee? But to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. They should do justly love mercy walk humbly with with, with God. So what does the Lord require of thee? What does the Lord require of thee? But to do Justly love mercy walk humbly with your God. As a sign of welcome and solidarity, simply take the hand of the person beside of you and squeeze it so that we know we're here together and we're alive. Amen. Welcome, welcome. We've gathered on the eve of this July 4th with solemn and soulful spirits to address the immigration crisis in our country and to denounce the immoral response of our leaders to this crisis and the assault on our democracy and freedoms by those drunk with power and greed. We have gathered to bear witness with one another that we are called as moral people, some of us rooted in our faith tradition, to offer compassion and sanctuary to the huddled masses longing for safety and freedom. On July the 5th, 1852 in Rochester, New York. Frederick Douglass addressed the Rochester's Ladies Anti-Slavery Society with a speech entitled, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? In the tradition and spirit of Douglass's address, we have come here this evening to hear a sermon by our nation's leading moral leader, the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber. Reverend Barber's sermon. 
Reverend Barber's sermon this evening is entitled, What to the Immigrant is the Fourth of July? As we prepare our hearts and minds to hear Reverend Barber, we will first hear from some of our sisters and brothers living in sanctuary. We will have a time of lamenting and mourning in silence. We will light 300 candles representing the over 300 detention centers on American soil. And we will call the names of those who have died in detention centers here in America. 167 years ago, Douglas said in his address, great streams are not easily turned from channels worn deep in the course of ages. As I read again his address this week, that line stuck out to me. Douglas didn't say great streams never turn from channels worn deep in the course of ages. He said great streams are not easily turned. We've not gathered because we think the path ahead is easy. We have gathered because when we stand together and when we work together, we have a much better chance of turning the stream toward a new channel that will in turn wear deep a future channel, a future course for the ages to come that celebrates the dignity of every human being. Another prophet, Jim Wallace, writes, it didn't start well, this American notion conceived in America's original sin of racial, racial dehumanization through indigenous land theft and the slavery of Africans. Yet many of the ideals that the nation's founders aspired to still hold the potential to build a future nation much better than the one we began with. And that has been the struggle ever since. And so tonight, here in this place, together, we continue the struggle toward life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all people. So in that spirit, let us share together in a litany for this occasion. We are at a crossroads in our nation's history between the America promised and yet to be and the atrocities of white nationalism and would that would cage humanity. The prophet Isaiah speaks across the centuries to us now, woe unto those who legislate evil who make laws that make victims, laws that make misery for the poor that rob my destitute people of dignity, exploiting defenseless widows, harm children. We must stop the detention of children. The words of Fannie Lou Hamer fall upon our shoulders now. It's time to get America right. We must demand a moral budget that ceases spending over $6 billion to terrorize and imprison our people and $1.2 billion to build a wall that does nothing to save us. We must resist separating families. The premise of our country rests on we, the people. Yet we, the people, have less voting rights today than we did 50 years ago. At least 23 states have passed racist voter suppression laws since 2010. The people must have their voice in order to establish justice. We have heard the words of the prophets. We know that we are woven into an interdependent web of existence, a single garment of destiny. Nations will be judged by whether they welcome the stranger or not. Therefore, we the people will rise up and answer the call to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly. The wisdom of the Quran commands us now to remember 
that when we save one person's life, we save all of humanity. Since 2017, 25 immigrants have died in the custody of ICE. Since September, five children have died in ICE custody or days after release. The words of Frederick Douglass ring true. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. So we demand an end to these concentration camps. And we won't be silent anymore. Good evening. My name is Jenny Bell, and I am a community organizer with Church World Service, and I work with the New Sanctuary Movement. There are currently 44 people in sanctuary across the country, and four of those people happen to be here in North Carolina. Unfortunately, they couldn't be here tonight to share their stories with you because of our broken immigration system, so I am here to lift up their names and their, and their stories. The first is Juana Tobar Ortega, who entered sanctuary over two years ago at St. Barnabas Episcopal Church in Greensboro. Juana fled from Guatemala in 1992 after receiving threats from armed combatants to seek asylum in the United States. She is a mother and a grandmother and an integral part of her community. Jose Chigas fled from El Salvador. He also has a family here in the United States and he's also a pastor of, an, of Iglesia Evangelica Jesus El Pan in Raleigh, North Carolina. Last weekend we had a press conference and a community event commemorating his two years in sanctuary. Eliseo Jimenez went into sanctuary in October of 2017 at Umstead Park United Methodist Church in Raleigh. He fled Mexico at the age of 17 and has lived here and started a family and has four U.S. citizen children. And finally, Rosa del Carmen Ortez Cruz is in sanctuary at Church of Reconciliation in Chapel Hill. She fled extreme domestic violence and has scars all over her body and fears for her life if she returns to her native country of Honduras. All of these people have family here in the United States and the reason that they are in sanctuary is because they want to stay here legally and they want to be here with their families. Rosa just received a letter from ICE along with a handful of other people across the United States telling her that she owes fines and hundreds of thousands of dollars for taking sanctuary. These leaders are being targeted by ICE and we must support them in any way that we can. So please reach out to me if you are interested in supporting them. The sanctuary movement is also calling on churches to be part of a movement of sacred resistance because we have heard that there will be raids happening soon, as soon as this weekend. And so we are asking churches to open their doors to be safe spaces for people if they need it, places where they can get legal advice, where they can get food, where they can find family members, where they can know that they will be safe. So if your congregation is willing to do that in case of raids, please talk to me. Finally, to, I want to close with a message of hope from Eliseo Jimenez, who's in sanctuary in Raleigh, um, because all of these people are Christians, they have strong belief in God, and they believe that there will be a miracle that will get them out of sanctuary, and I believe it too, and I hope you do too. Thank you. I've been here in sanctuary for almost two years. I take a sanctuary here uh, so, uh, so not be separated from my kids. I enjoy the time when they're here with me. Uh, most of the time I feel bad when they left. But right now with, with the school or with the summer off, I, I, I love to have them here. I'm originally from Mexico. I took sanctuary so not to be separated from my kids. And my experience here has been, uh, i say, wonderful and really I have a lot of support. Uh, the only things I feel bad is like when everybody left and there ain't nobody around here to talk or, or have a conversation. Sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's kind of easy, but uh, I, just, I just go with the day. So we journey into our hopeful future of joy, learning to offer each other welcome, compassion, and care. May God grant us wisdom, grace, and guidance in our life together.
the church here is, is, is been wonderful. I, I, I cannot ask for a better church. And uh, uh, my hope for the future is to be able to go back with my family, uh, spend more time with, with my kids the way I used to, to support my kids and take care of them. We have come here tonight to raise our voice, to be heard, to bear witness that what is happening here in America in terms of the immigration crisis is sinful. We've also come here tonight to mourn, to lament what is happening to our children and our sisters and brothers who are in the detention centers and who are standing at the border asking for our help. In one of the many faith traditions that's represented here this evening, one of the writers of a sacred text of one of our faith traditions writes this, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. I don't know about you, but lately as I've looked at images, almost everywhere I turn of our sisters and brothers of all ages, children, youth, adults, young and old, as I've seen these images of them locked in cages, stacked on top of one another in rooms with no water or blankets, enduring deplorable conditions. My heart has felt those sighs that are too deep for words. And so it is, along with our words tonight, we want to make room for the Spirit to intercede. And along with the Spirit, we want to offer our sighs, our lamenting, our mourning for those held in the detention centers here in the United States and all across the world. So we're going to enter into some silence now. And in that silence, you are invited to offer your prayers however you pray. And if you're not sure how to pray or if you don't pray, that's okay. Just sigh, mourn, cry out with whatever voice you have and lament as a way to bear witness to the pain of those suffering in detention centers in this country. And after some silence, we will read the names of those who have died in detention centers here in America. And as we do all of this, two of our young people will light 300 candles for those held in more than 300 detention centers here on American soil. Let us mourn. Let us weep. Let us lament. Let us sigh. Let us bear that witness to the pain and suffering of our children, fathers, mothers, men and women, young and old. With the Spirit, let us intercede now. Let us remember our brothers and sisters that have died in this nation in the detention centers. Gorgon Marman from Armenia died April 10, 2018. Ronald Cruz, also known as Ronald Francisco Ramera from Honduras, age 39, died May 16, 2018. Roxanne Hernandez, also known as Jeffrey Hernandez from Honduras, age 33, 
died May 25th, 2018. Cha Huy Tran from Vietnam, age 47, died June 12, 2018. Ifraín Ramero de la Cruz, Mexico, age 40, died July 10, 2018. Augustina Ramirez Raola, from Mexico, age 62, died July 15, I'm sorry, July 25, 2018. Wilfredo Padrón de Cuba, age 58, died November 1st, 2018. Mergensana Amar, Russia, age 40, died November 18, 2018. German walk off from Russia, age 56, died November 30th, 2018. Felipe Alonso Gomez from Guatemala, age eight, died December 25th, 2018. Jacqueline Cal, age seven, Guatemala, died December 2018. Aber Reyes Clemente, Mexico, age 54, died April 3rd, 2019. Simpal Singh, India, age 21, died May 3rd, 2019. Marie Juarez from Guatemala died April 2018, 19 months old after leaving the detention center. Dios oye tu gritos y ve tu persecución. God hears your cries and sees your persecution. Ahora recibe nuestros hermanos y hermanas. Now receive, God, our brothers and sisters. Amen. As we continue in our mourning and lamenting and in our silence, it's time for us to cry out, people. Let God hear your sighs and your cries. Oh, 
hold it high, hold it high. Somebody's lost, somebody's lost in the harbor. In the harbor, you can't hold it low. In the storm, hold your light, hold your light, hold it high, hold it high. Somebody's lost, somebody's lost. They're lost in the harbor. In the Hold it up high. You got to hold it high. Somebody lost. Somebody's lost in the storm. Out of the silence, I hear the ancestors. At our shoulders now on the eve of the birth of these United States of America, I hear the ancestors. 243 years ago, the founding fathers of this country declared the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I am among those who, by adoption, find myself related to one William Tanner, an indentured servant who came to these colonies in the 1600s and whose arbitrary birth and the lies of racism shaped his life and, in turn, the course of my own. Out of the silence on this July 3rd, 2019, I hear the ancestors stirring. I hear Frederick Douglass on July 3rd, 1852, as he reminded the president and elected officials and clergy, too, of the hypocrisy of declarations of devotion to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the face of the brutality and human degradation of American chattel slavery. We gather now on this July 3rd, 2019, as tanks are readied to be displayed with fireworks and pledges of allegiance while false prophets declare their devotion to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, all while signing orders to cage children, to imprison their parents as wailing witnesses to death sentences, while building walls, monuments to white nationalism, and denying babies diapers, forcing mothers to drink from toilets while so-called evangelical preachers bear false witness and promulgate chattel theology with declarations that deal death blows to the poor and warn of inevitable consequences in detention centers, declaring that Christian charity denies the refugees' humanity. Let us not be confused this night, beloved, we are faced with the raucous celebration of liberty while her body is caged in a concentration camp. 
Some have said not to use such a phrase that it cannot be in our country at this time, that perhaps to do so is even anti-Semitic. And yet I am reminded of the teachings of the esteemed elder Rabbi Arthur Wasco, who tells us that history teaches dehumanization and genocide occurs in stages. The Nazi state opened the first concentration camp at Dachau in 1933 as a prison. So what inevitable consequences do supposed Christians speak of today? Let us have soul clarity this night, for the ancestors are stirring. They are telling us that this is chattel theology as old, as evil, as ancient as the devil. And y'all know now when a Unitarian Universalist speaks of the devil, something is happening. This chattel theology whispered into the broken hearts of men and women the promises that capital built on stolen land taken by the decimation of indigenous people and built upon the backs of enslaved people would be justification one day for the glory of a country to come. That infinite progress had a small price tag, just the humanity of a few million. This chattel theology colonizes the souls of Americans in the face of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to whisper that there is not enough, that 140 million poor and low wealth people in these United States are a necessary sacrifice for the market God. This chattel theology would have us believe we are safer by building up military contractors, militarizing our borders, terrorizing our communities, and then absconding with the vote of the people because America, it says, is a scarce resource, and freedom is not free, and liberty must be caged and convicted by the origin of her birth. But the ancestors are stirring as they have before. On the eve of some independence, they are stirring to set ourselves anew, to hear their urging from the dizzying infection of division and hate, the politicking that punishes the poor and cages children, that grinds those in the cogs of this capitalism as means to an end, as a political pathway to gain. We come to hear the urgings of the ones who came before in the name of a God that does not choose political parties but proclaims the last shall be first. Who defies the borders and liberates the camps. We come called by the soul of that lady at the shore. Send me your tired, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Called we come by the prophets of love and justice who in the face of this insidious chattel theology, in the face of death and concentration camps and the growing 140 million poor and low wealth, who urge us when we are told of those needing to be imprisoned, killed, punished by nationality or poverty or childhood, they are urging us against the blasphemy of necessary sacrifices. They are urging us across the history of humanity. Not one more. Not one more. Not one more. May their prophecy be our promise this night.
Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me. Walk with me.
Let me first begin by thanking Steve and Robin and Yara and Rob for taking on this task of pulling us together tonight. And let me thank Reverend Dr. Petty and all the members of Pullen for this invitation and opening to come to this sanctuary. We're here tonight, and I want you to know that we have received and accepted an invitation from clergy on the ground to help call clergy and congresspersons back to the border in exactly 25 days. If things don't get better, to engage in direct action. Amen. We're also here tonight to say that in September, we will begin an 18 month more tour, we must do more, mobilization, organizing, mobilizing, registering, and educating tour from September to next May. We must rally the conscience of our people in this time. And that on June 20, 2020, we are calling for a mass poor people's assembly and moral march on Washington for tens of thousands of us to gather right after the primaries, just before the elections, to reshape the narrative of this country and to infuse it into every stream of our body politics. And so part of the reason I'm here tonight by invitation is to explain why we must gather clergy and congresspersons and go back to the border and engage in direct action, why we must have this we must do more tour mobilizing, organizing, registering, and educating, and why we must have a mass poor people's assembly and moral march on Washington. 167 years ago, Frederick Douglass, a former slave who had escaped, found his way to the north in New York, where he grew in learning and became a key leader of the abolition movement. Actually, some of his growing was in New York and some of it was in Massachusetts. I've been to both places. I've stood at the headstone of his grave. 167 years ago, Douglas, one of the best known orators and freedom fighters our country has ever known, spoke at the ladies, I want you to hear that, the ladies anti-slavery society. This year is not the first year, it's been the year of the woman. That, the ladies. <clears throat> Anti-slavery society in Corinthian Hall in Rochester, New York, in what was billed as the 4th of July speech. Looking out over the august audience filling the hall, Frederick Douglass began with the recognition that the birthday of your national independence and of your political freedom, it was, as he said, not my independence. And that certainly 
he had had little political freedom of his own to celebrate. Let's bring this mic down and get that um, echo out, please. Douglas proceeded to ask this question. Why had he even been invited? Now his critique did not come from some great hatred of America. He actually, with careful admiration, talked well of some parts of America's beginning. Frederick Douglass, like many people of color, have never criticized America from a place of eternal hatred or some place of an eternal vendetta. In fact, those in the lineage of Douglas and Fannie Lou Hamer and Cesar Chavez, my father, have mourned in their critique. They have always had hope for the nation, even in the midst of the hell that it put them through. They've always believed in the potential despite the reality of the pain. People of color, the truth be told, have been the greatest patriots of this nation and have given more to this country than they have ever taken. <clears throat> Such was the case when Douglas rose that evening and as he asked the question, what to the slave is the 4th of July? He began, and I quote, the point from which I am compelled to view them is not certainly the most favorable, and yet I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less than admiration. That was his careful admiration of the founding fathers. But then he said, but such is not the state of the case. I say it with a sad sense of disparity between us. I am not included within the pale glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you and not by me. This fourth of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, but I mourn. And then from this place of mourning, Douglas said, my spirit weary of such blasphemy and how such men can be supported as the standing types and representatives of Jesus Christ. And I want folk to understand who listened to this, the audience he was speaking to was primarily white. White people who are part of the abolition movement whose spirits also wearied. He said, they call themselves representative of Jesus Christ. How they do that is a mystery, which I leave others to penetrate. <laughs> In speaking of the American church, however, let it be distinctly understood that I mean the great mass of religious organizations of our land. There are exceptions, and I thank God that there are. Noble men may be found scattered all over these northern states, of whom Henry Ward Beecher of Brooklyn and Samuel J. May of Syracuse and my esteemed friend, the Reverend R. R. Raymond, on the platform are shining examples. And let me say further that upon these men lies the duty to inspire our ranks with high religious faith and zeal and to cheer us on in the great mission of the slave's redemption from his chains. But one is struck with the difference between the attitude of the American church toward the anti-slavery movement and that the occupied by the church that, and that occupied by the churches in England toward a similar movement in that country. There, the church, true to its mission of ameliorating, alleviating, and improving the condition of mankind came forward promptly 
bound up the wounds of the West Indian slave and restored him to his liberty. There the question of emancipation was a high religious question. It was demanded in the name of humanity and according to the laws of the living God. The Sharps, the Clarkstons, the Wilberforces, the Buxtons, the Birchells, the Nibs were alike famous for their piety and their philanthropy. philanthropy. The anti-slavery movement there was not an anti-church movement for the reason that the church took its full share in prosecuting that movement and the anti-slavery movement in this country will cease to be an anti-church movement when the church of this country shall assume a favorable instead of a hostile position toward the movement. Americans, he said, your Republican politics, not less than your Republican religion, are fragrantly, flagrantly inconsistent. You boast of your love of liberty, your superior civilization, and your pure Christianity, while the whole political power of the nation is solemnly pledged to support and perpetrate the enslavement of three millions of your countrymen. You hurl your, 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 your anathemas at the crown-headed tyrants of Russia and Austria and pride yourselves in the democratic institution while you, you yourselves consent to be mere tools and bodyguards of the tyrants of Virginia and Carolina. You invite to your shores fugitives of oppression from abroad, honor them with banquets, greet them with ovations, cheer them, toast them, salute them, protect them, and pour out your money to them like water. But the fugitives of your own land, you advertise, hunt, arrest, shoot, and kill. You glory in your refinement and your universal education, and yet you maintain a system as barbarous and dreadful as ever stained the character of a nation. You shed tears over fallen hungry and make the sad stories of her wrong the theme of your poets and statesmen and orators till your gallant sons are ready to fly to arms to vindicate her cause against her oppressors. But in regard to the tens of thousands of wrongs of the American slave, you would enforce the strictest silence. You're all on fire at the mention of liberty for France or Ireland but you're as cold as an iceberg at the thought of liberty for the enslaved of America. You declare before the world and are understood by the world to declare that you hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And yet you hold securely in a bondage which according to your own Thomas Jefferson is worse than the ages of that which your fathers rose in rebellion to oppose. A seventh part of the inhabitants of your country enslaved. That was his mourning. And then after his mourning publicly and his mourning painfully, he then warned America prophetically. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer. A day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. To him, your celebration is sham, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sound of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciation of tyrant brass-fronted impudence. Your shout of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your service and thanksgiving with all of your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the United States at this very hour. He mourned publicly. He mourned that night painfully. And then he warned America prophetically. Having accepted this invitation tonight and the invitation to join others to eventually go to the border, 
I want to stand in the spirit of Douglas and ask the question, what to the immigrant and to people of color is the 4th of July? But not do I just want to stand in the spirit of Douglas. I want to stand in the spirit of Amos. Amos, the great Hebrew prophet, who said in Amos 5, I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and your conventions. I want nothing to do with your religion projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick and tired of your fundraising schemes. I'm sick and tired of your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music playing the harp to your own narcissistic ways. When was the last time you as a nation really sang to me, to God? Do you know what I want, the God? Do you know what I want? I want justice. I want oceans of it. I want fairness. I want it to roll down like waters and like mighty streams, and that's all I want. I stand, I stand humbly tonight in the tradition of Ezekiel, that other great Hebrew prophet who said, listen, there comes a time you have to tell the truth, and that is that your preachers violate my law and desecrate my holy things. Many of them can't tell the difference between the sacred and the secular. They tell people there's no difference between right and wrong. Your politicians are like wolves, prowling and killing, rapturously taking whatever they want. And your preachers cover up for the politicians pretending to have received visions and special revelation. These preachers say this is what God says when God hadn't told them one thing. <laughs> and that is why extortion is rife. Robbery is epidemic. The poor and the needy are abused and the strangers and the immigrants are kicked around at will with no access to justice. Right. I'm trying tonight to stand humbly in the, in, the, in the place that Jesus called us to in Matthew 25, when Jesus warned the nations before the nation crucified him, before the state killed him, for being one who dared to take on Caesar. Jesus said, you know, when, it finally, when, 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 when the Lord finally comes, all the nations will be arranged before him. All the nations, the sheep and the goats. Sheep on the right, goats on the left, sheep on the right. And the king will say to the nations, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was homeless, you gave me a room. When I was shivering, you gave me clothes. When I was a stranger, you took me in. And the sheep will say, when did we do this? And the king will say, when you did it unto the least of these, you did it unto me. And then that king will turn to the goats and say to them, to that nation, get out of my sight. Because when I was hungry, you didn't give me a meal. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me a drink. When I was a stranger, an immigrant, you gave me no welcome. When I was shivering, you gave me no clothes. When I was sick and in prison, you did not visit me. It is in these traditions that I want to declare that today, more than a century and a half later, Douglas's question leads us to cry out together again with all who have yet to receive the promise of liberty in this land. What to the immigrant and to people of color is the 4th of July? I say to America, how dare us? How dare us celebrate the fourth? As though, as though nothing is wrong. How dare us in this moment, in this particular place in history, in this Zitzenleben, this setting, how dare us act if, it's all, if it's all is well? How dare us engage in our normal routines? How dare us take a vacation from our legitimate critique? How dare us, with attacks on voting rights of people of color like we haven't seen since Jim Crow, with the Supreme Court legitimizing discrimination as long as it happens under the scheme of partisanism, 
with Latino children and women and men and families in cages with 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country, 60% of black people poor and low wealth. 40% of Asian people poor and low wealth. 58% of Native Americans poor and low wealth. 64% of Latinos poor and low wealth. How dare us think a parade can cover this over? How dare us? How dare us think that pomp and circumstance can hide the injustices that are painfully penetrating the lives of people. To do so would to be engaged, to engage over again in bombast fraud and hypocrisy. And one question for the nation though is, how and why do we keep finding ourselves in this moment? in these moments is because too many do try to cover up the mythologies and false religions that have undergirded so much injustice. Our nation too often has attempted to cover up, parade up, celebrate up rather than face up and repent and truly exercise the demons of racism and hate from our nation's body politic. And if we are to be a whole nation, we must tell the truth about why we keep dealing with these issues if we are going to ever face, fix, and move fully forward beyond them. So the truth is, we cannot celebrate this nation's liberty without an honest accounting of those who have not been free in this land. Who gets to stake their, life, their claim to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Whose colonial status ended with the Declaration of Independence? Whose rights are guaranteed by the Bill of Rights? From the very beginning, those rights have been limited by perceptions of race, and systemic realities of racism. For people of color, the rights guaranteed by our Constitution have been much more a hope and a promise than a lived reality. The founding mythologies of the United States as a land of goodness, of fairness, of equity for those who sought respite from tyranny on these shores are complicated by a closer look at who was not welcomed here. If the promise of a more perfect union is a th through line in our history, so too is the reality of white supremacy and the need to genocide some people, the need to enslave some people, and the need to exclude some people and immigrants. Anyone who wants to go back to the imagined greatness of the past better be careful how far you go back because you just might be going back to the future. Even if President Trump is considered white today, he would do well to remember that the founders did not include the German Trumps in their imagination of whiteness. In 1751, Benjamin Franklin asked, why should Pennsylvania, founded by the English, become a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of Anglifying us, and will never adapt to our language and customs any more than they can acquire our complexion? 150 years before Frederick Trump, some say was run out, some say fled, famine in Bavaria to make a life in New York City, a celebrated signature of both the Declaration and the Constitution couldn't imagine the Bill of Rights applying even to a Trump. Many people who celebrated America as the land of the free today were not included. This is this ugly, complicated history. They were not included at one time in this nation's past. There was a time when Germans, Jews, Irish, and others who are considered white today were not included in America's definition of whiteness. And 
Douglass knew too well, American identity has always been exclusive for those identified as non-white. In fact, when Douglass addressed the moral contradiction of the 4th of July for black people in 1852, the Know Nothing Party, a populist movement of the mid-19th century, whose rhetoric is echoed by the Make America Great Again crowd today, was setting up fear of Irish immigrants, portraying Irish immigrants as black, like Douglas, and thus not the rightful heirs of the liberty of the nation, this nation promised. And while the hard-won work of Reconstruction wrote equal protection under the law for all persons into the Constitution, systemic racism and anti-immigrant sentiments worked hand in hand to create an American imagination. It was the sick sociology, the bad biology, the evil economics that only the ends justify the means and the heretical ontology that said to some, you can dismiss others on the basis of color. Yeah, that's what led to the genocide of Native Americans, to the chattel slavery of African Americans, and to constant chastisement and persecution of immigrants who were not like us. And then even in the 20th century, there was this explicit white su supremacy Take, for example, University Lothrop Stardust, the rising tide of color against white world supremacy, which passed for scholarship in the early 20th century. He said, his scholarship said, non-white races must be excluded from America. The red and black races, if left to themselves, revert to a savage or semi-savage in a short time. Such sentiments were the status quo among politicians and elites well into the 20th century. They were written into the law through the Asian Exclusion Act, the National Origins Act, the words of welcome and protection by the great poet Emma Lazarus cast in bronze on the base of the Statue of Liberty in New York's harbor have been mocked regularly since they were first penned in 1883 by the harsh reality of exclusion, separation, and incarceration of those who sought refuge and safety in the United States. Even the concept that's used now in the South to block black people, gerrymandering, was first used in the North to exclude the Irish and the Polish and those who were considered not white. So you see, this anti-immigrant ugliness and viciousness toward people of color has a long history. And when it comes to our southern border, there's another violent link connected to slavery. Those from Mexico and Central America did not cross the border. We started a war to take the border. <laughs> Mexico abolished slavery in 1829. Texas was a part of the Mexico territory. New Mexico was not New Mexico, it was Mexico. California was not California, it was, New Me it was Mexico. The Texans wanted to keep their slaves. The Cal people in Cal so-called would-be California wanted to go. And so, as America has done, we started a war. In 1840s, the Mexican American War. And Henry David Thoreau, whom Dr. King learned from and through his writings, first engaged in direct action and civil disobedience by refusing to pay the taxes that he knew was being used to fund a war that was taking land from our Mexican brothers and sisters. Now, the Mexican War, the way we were taught, Mexican-American War, was formally concluded, we've been taught, by the Treaty of Guadalupe, which, but really what happened was the treaty was forced, and Mexico was forced to give up Texas, New Mexico, and California. So I often ask the question, how can people be illegal in a land that once was theirs?
When you hear those today that say we don't want to believe in open borders, no, because you believe in stolen borders. That's why. But not only that link, that violent, more recently, it is our military policies, particularly under Reagan and continuing under others, that, 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 that destabilized Central America. U.S. supported regressive government in El Salvador whose death squads killed thousands and led to tens and hundreds of thousands losing their homes. Many fled the country seeking refuge in the United States. The United States went to war directly and supported anti-government guerrilla movement against the Sandinista government in Nicaragua. That war also killed thousands, created huge numbers of refugees. Our own wars destabilized the very Central America that we now want to demonize. Hmm. But not just when it comes to Im immigrants. We also have to look at the contorted history in regards to race and people of color through the lens that Brother Kendi, Ibram Kendi has written. He's written a book called Stamped from the Beginning which he makes the emotional and empirically, emotionally and empirically clear that policies of racism come first. Listen to me. Systemic policies that comes first. Systemic policy racist desires come first and then cultural lives follow to justify them. In fact, the title of his book comes from such an episode and helps us to understand. And if you understand what he says, you understand why coming down the escalator, Trump labeled Mexican rapists and murderers and said black people live in hell because he had policies he wanted to implement and he needed cultural lies to support them. It is why Trump claimed voter fraud, which is a lie, because he needed the lies to support the policies. This is also why far too many Democrats can never really address race because they get stuck in and on cultural racism and do not deal with systemic policy racism. <laughs> now, Brother Kennedy notes how this has always worked by pointing out an episode in 1860. Let me quote from his book. He says, listen, the title stamped from the beginning comes from a speech that Mississippi Senator Jefferson Davis gave on the floor of the United States Senate on April 12, 1860. The future president of the Confederacy was a senator, U.S. Senator. He objected to a bill funding black education in Washington, D.C. And this is what he said, the government was not founded by Negroes nor for Negroes, but by white men for white men. Davis lectured his colleagues. The bill was based on the false notion of racial equality, he declared. The inequality of white and black races was stamped from the beginning. Kendi also writes further and notes in his writing, writing something we must hear. He said, the culprits of racism rarely confess to their racist public policies and ideas. But why would they? Racists confessing to their crimes is not in their self-interest. It has been smarter and more ex exonerating to identify what they did and said as not racist. Criminals hardly ever acknowledge their crimes against humanity, and the shrewdest and most powerful anti-black criminals have legitimized and legalized their criminal activities. They have defined their crimes of slave trading and enslaving and discrimination and killing and genocide outside the criminal code. Likewise, the shrewdness of the most powerful racist out of your laws have managed to define their ideas outside of racism. They have claimed instead that they were merely articulating God's word, that they were merely protecting the nation and engaging in this for nation security. They were merely following scientific plan or they were merely just following plain old common sense. 
We have to understand this history to understand how we keep coming to these moments. And then finally, Brother Kendi says, listen, in order to fully explain the complex history of racist ideas, stamped from the beginning must chronicle this racial progress and simultaneously the progress of racist politics, policies. Hate and ignorance have not driven the history of racist ideas in America. Racist policies have driven the history of racist ideas. And this fact becomes apparent when we examine the cause behind, not the consumption of racist ideas, but the production of racist ideas. What caused U.S. Senator John C. Calhoun of South Carolina in 1837 to produce the racist idea of slavery as a positive good when he knew slavery's torturous history? He wanted the slavery, so he came up with the ideas. What caused the Atlanta newspaper editor Henry W. Grady in 1885 to produce the racist idea of separate but equal? When he knew southern communities were hardly separate or equal. What caused? What causes it? Time and time again, says Kendi, racist ideas have not been cooked up from the boiling pot of ignorance and hate. Racism in this country does not come from those in the backwoods who are, who are ignorant and who don't know what they're doing. Time and time again, Kendi reminds us, powerful and brilliant men and women have produced racist ideas in order to justify racist policies in their era. They do it in order to redirect the blame for their era's racial disparities away from their policies owned to black people or owned to some ignorant people over there. And then Kendi says something that I now have to confess to. Many of us were taught the popular folk tale of racism. That ignorant and hateful people, if they were just educated better, had produced racist ideas and these racist people had instituted racist policies. But when we learn the motives behind the production of many of America's most influential racist idea, Kendi says, and we, I believe, have to agree, it becomes quite obvious that this folk tale, though sensible, was not, is not based on the firm footing of historical evidence. Ignorance, hate, racist ideas, discrimination. This casual relationship is largely ahistorical. It actually, it has actually been the inverse. Racial discrimination led to racist ideas, which led to ignorance and hate. Racial discrimination, racist ideas, and ignorance and hate. This is the relationship driving America's history of race relations. And my friend, for these and so many reasons, and so many others, that's why we're in the hell we're in. And that's why we must protest much. Because we have, as a nation, never faced this and dealt with this history and the lies and the mythologies. Because of that, we find ourselves in another glaring moment that reveals we are still sick and broken as a nation. We find ourselves, because of this, Asking what Arthur Kennedy said, many people asked in 217, how could Donald Trump follow Barack Obama into the presidency? How could the candidate of angry bigots, the Klan's candidate, the stop and frisk candidate, the candidate of border walls, the candidate that said a Latino judge can't be objective, the candidate that says if you elect me I'll take your health care, the candidate who said the minimum wage is already too high, how could that candidate, how could this birth of theorist follow the first black president? How could Trump rise when Obama's rise seemed to make it impossible? Because we've never faced the mythologies and the lies, we find ourselves in this situation. Because we've never dealt with these lies and mythologies and injustice, we find ourselves in a time 
where legislation, legislative actions and legal decisions at the federal and state level have severely restricted the ability of people of color, especially poor black people, Latinas, and Native Americans, to participate in the democ democratic process. Think about that, in the 21st century. How is this possible? The Shelby decision in 2013 that gutted the 1964 voting rights, and then at the same time, the number of citizens disfranchised due to felony conviction, a pernicious form of voter suppression tripled from 2 million in 1968 to 6.1 million in 2016, including one in 13 black adults. More than 23 states have adopted some form of voter suppression laws. In the latest 2018 midterm election cycle, severe voter suppression efforts tainted elections, for example, in Georgia, Florida, Texas, Kansas, Alabama, Missouri, North Carolina, North Dakota, including through voter purges, voter registration problems, strict voter ID, ballot requirements, voter confusion, intimidation, harassment, poll closures, long lines, malfunctioning voting equipment, and new signature matching requirements. How is it that folk are doing this? Because we've never faced the lies and the mythologies and the intentionality and even, might I say, the brilliance of those who intend to make sure that this democracy is never whole for the immigrant and for people of color. And because of this, voter suppression in the country, now people are able to select persons who continue to push and pass and support policies like what we see at the border. There's a direct line between the suppression of black and brown vote, between voter suppression and gerrymandering, to having state capitals and federal government led by a majority of people that will enable a president to do what we see being done. And we must connect the fact that those who engage in and try to cover up racist gerrymandering will use a partisan scheme to stack and pack black and Latino votes as a way of isolating and nullifying the power of those votes and they don't do it not to just stop the election of black people. They do it to disable the ability of black, white, and brown voters to form fusion coalition, especially in the South. And then the gerrymandering is set up as a way of allowing people who do not receive the majority of the, of the popular votes to actually control state houses and then to rig elections and then to pass policies that hurt all people, the poor, the sick, the gay, the women, the working, mostly poor white people, but most of all as a way of a controlling and isolating power because of the fear of the possibility of a strong black, brown, Asian, native, white coalition that will control this liberal democracy in a few years for the first time ever in history. Huh? because of the long train of lies and mythology about race and racism and immigrants, we find ourselves now in a place where, despite the fact, here it is, despite the fact that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights guarantees unequivocally that everyone has the right to seek and enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution. Hear me now. Despite the fact that the 1967 Convention on Refugees outlines the basic rights of refugees fleeing their countries and seeking refuge and because of well-founded fear and being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group and political opinion, that they have the right to seek that asylum despite the fact that they are supposed to have that right without discrimination as to race, religion, or country of origin, despite the fact that U.S. domestic law starts with the requirement of the Convention on Refugees, recognizing the rights of people who have fled persecution in their own country. And then through the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act, the law says, the law, that any alien who is physically present in the United States, who arrives in the United States, irrespective of such alien status, may apply 
for asylum. The law says that anyone whether they, without documents who gets to the United States border or in this country has the right to apply for asylum without discrimination and despite the fact that the 14th Amendment, the salvation of our Constitution, without it, the Constitution falls apart. For it declares equal protection under law. Watch this, watch this. For all persons, not citizens. Despite all of those laws, why is it that we have Latino immigrants and families and babies being held like animals, denied of basic subsistence? Why is it that they're being forced to drink from toilets? Why is it? that they are dying. Just last night, the government's own inspector general had to report, maybe that's prophetic, came out on July 2nd, that the overcrowding at these camps is inhumane, despite all these laws. 2,669 children in detention camps today. A third have been there illegally over the 72 hour limit. Children under the age of seven have been held in cages for over two weeks. Single men and women are being held in standing room cages, some for over a week. Most had not had a shower and were wearing the same clothes they came in with for over a month ago. Children are being fed nothing but bologna sandwich for days on end. Children, in the past four years, there have been more, been an average of more than a thousand children per year that have been reported sexually assaulted. 25 people have died in ICE custody since Trump took office. And the mo two most profitable private companies contracted to manage detained immigrants included the GEO Group and the Core Civic, previously known as Corrections Corporations of America, and the lobbying arm of the GEO Group spent $1.56 million on lobbying in 2018 and contributed $275,000 to pro-Trump super PAC, Rebuilding America in 2016. But how is this, this with all these laws, how does that go on? Because of the way the lies and the mythologies of race have never been faced and dealt with in this country. And that is why we continually see what we see again and again. But the truth of the matter is, the asylum seekers and the refugees appearing at our southern borders, they are not the lawbreakers. The president is the lawbreaker. And not only is he the lawbreaker, the Congress people who enable it are the lawbreakers. The leaders in our state houses are the lawbreakers. The ICE and Custom Border Patrol agents that carry out these illegal laws rather than say no. Rather than say no, I will not carry out an unjust law. And if we are silent, we too are the lawbreakers. You allow persons to die and separate children and make women and children drink from toilets and make them beg for relief and watch them get raped and treat them worse than you treat a prisoner of war. We break not only man's law, but we break the law of the divine. Those who telling lies on the Latino immigrants, even the Christian preachers that are going to Trump and others and saying, this is what God would have you do. They are not only the lawbreakers, they are the heresy makers. Why, why, why though? Because we've never faced 
the lies and the mythologies that have been used to undergird these policies so people get away with them as though they're benign, as though they're not really race. Like the lies that are told on immigrants. Immigrants take from our society. Well, in reality, a report by the National Academy, Academy of Science and Engineering and Medicine found that immigrants have little or no effect on wages and employment. In fact, because many of them are entrepreneurs, they actually build the economy. The lie, the racist lie that un undocumented immigrants, immigrants don't pay taxes. Undocumented immigrants pay an average of $11.64 billion in taxes every year. They also pay to help sustain the Social Security Trust Fund. In 2010, undocumented individuals paid $13 billion. And the, you know, the people we stole their border from them, they paid $13 billion into retirement accounts and only received $1 billion in return. And they've contributed up to $300 billion to the Social Security Trust Fund. And without it, the rest of us may never get our Social Security. <laughs> Studies have confirmed they're, they're rapists, they're, they're murderers. No, no. Studies confirm that immigrants are less likely to commit crimes than native-born Americans. And how dare some of the folk who are operating today in the same philosophy of past segregationists and slaveholders call anybody violent? Because of these lies, because of the mythologies, because we've never faced them, because as a nation we've tried to cover them up, parade them over, and engage in hypocrisy, we also find ourselves in this situation where even religion is being used to justify demons. That is the definition of blasphemy. When religion is used to call that which is good bad and that which is bad good, that is the definition of blasphemy. So what is our hope in this moment? In the midst of this hell, this repeated hell, this kind of hell that we keep seeing over and over again, what is our hope in this moment? What is, what is, what is it? What must we do, the immigrant and people of color and progressive and conscientious white people and others well, the first hope is the truth. Truth is always the first hope. You must tell the truth, for only the truth can set us free. Frederick Douglass knew that. It was dangerous that night for him to tell the truth. It may be dangerous tonight to tell this truth, but Frederick Douglass knew that we must know it. We must know the truth. And with the first hope is to not accept the lies, not accept the mythology, not accept the hypocrisy, not accept the ugly history as having the last say, and not to hide it, but to tell it and to expose it to the light. That is the first hope. That is why all over the nation we are live streaming and telling this truth and saying to folk, don't accept the lies anymore. But the next hope, David, is the hope Jesus said in Matthew. Sometimes I don't know if nations will turn, as Frederick Douglass said, it's hard to turn a stream that is so deeply embedded. I don't know if things will turn immediately, but I know there is a hope in warning the nation. Huh? There is a certain place in which it's not our duty to make the nation change, but it is our duty to make sure the nation knows it's wrong. Huh? Like Jesus did in Matthew, Matthew 25. It is important to let any nation, I don't care what that nation is, I don't care how many damn tanks they put on the, on the, on the streets tomorrow. It is important to let a nation know you are not bigger than God, you're not bigger than the divine, you're not bigger than the moral art of your universe. It is important to let the nation know that if you read history right, every despot has fallen. Every one of them. Every unjust leader is fallen. Every country that did not take care of the people inside of its borders and, and those who were, wanted to come has been, has fallen, has crumbled. Ask Rome! It's important.
important to warn the nation. You will not get away. You will not get away. You will not get away. But then the next hope is found right there in Amos 5. I read to you part of it. Now let me read to you the rest of what it said. Is that these are instructions that are given to us for every age in the face of injustice. After Amos talks about what's going on and says, God says, I don't want to hear your noise of your songs and all these conventions. I don't, uh -uh. He says, let me tell you something. God says, when it, this is in Amos, in the, in the Hebrew Bible, it says, when it looks like justice is a lost cause, Wish I had a few preachers in here. When it looks like evil is epidemic. When it looks like decent people are just throwing up their hands. And when it looks like protest and rebuke are useless and a waste of breath. The divine says, I need a people. I don't need everybody. I just need a remnant. I need a people who will seek good and not evil and live. I need a people who say to the nation, if you claim that God is your friend, well, live like it. I need a people that will hate evil and love good. And I, it's in the Bible. I need a people who will work it out in the public square. I need a people who will go out into the streets and cry loudly and shut down the malls and the shops at the cries of doom. I need somebody who will close down the offices, the stores, the factories. I need the people that will enlist everybody they can find into a general lament and if you get in the street and if you do your work then God says I'll hear it and I'll help you stop what the nation is doing and so as it fell the lot of Frederick Douglass and William Lord Garrison and Harriet Tubman as it fell the lot of Fannie Lou Hamer and Martin and Viola Woosa it's our lot now it's our lot to refuse to be quiet about what we see going on we must engage at the border we must engage at the ballot box we must engage with the Bible. We must engage with the basics of the Constitution. We must engage in the legislature's boardroom. If Douglas and others didn't stand down then, we can't stand down now. No. And this is why this is why we've accepted the call, the Macedonian call from other clergy at the border to come to the border on July 28th, 29th, calling clergy and congresspersons and other people of conscience. That's why we've accepted the call to engage in direct action because this moment must embolden our resistance as others turn the tide in their day. We must turn the tide in our day. We who believe in freedom cannot relax or be irrelevant. No, we must register our discontent loudly, strongly, faithfully, and fervently in every place, in every space. We must make contemporary the call that Langston Hughes gave in 1935. We must make it contemporary today. I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I'm the Negro bearing slavery scars. I'm the red man driven from the land. I'm the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog and mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope, tangled in the ancient endless chains of profit, power, gain, and grab of the, of the land, of grab of gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the men, take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer 
bondsman to the soul. I am the worker sold to the machine. I am the Negro servant to you all. I am the people humble, hungry, mean, hungry, yet today despite the dream, beaten yet today. Oh, pioneers, I am the man who never got ahead, the poorest worker battered through the years, yet I am the one who dreamt our basic dream. In the old world, still while still a serf of king, who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true, that even yet its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone, in every furrow turn that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I am the man or the woman who sailed those early seas in search of what I, I meant to be my home, for I am the one who left Dark Island shore and Poland's plain and England's glassy lee. And I'm the man that was torn from black Africa's strand. I came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said free? Not me, surely not me. The millions on relief today. The millions shot down when we strike. The millions who have nothing for our pay. For all the dreams we've dreamed and all the songs we've sung. And all the hopes we've held and all the flags we've hung. The millions who have nothing for our pay except the dream that's almost dead today. But oh, let America be America again, a land that never has been yet and yet must be. The land where every man, every woman is free. The land that's mine, the poor man's, the Indians, the Negroes, me. Who made America? Whose sweat and blood? Whose faith in the pain? Whose hand at the foundry? Whose plow in the rain? We must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain from those who live like leeches on the people's lives. We must must take back our land again, America. Oh yes, I say it plain, America. You never were America to me, but I swear this oh that America will be out of the wreck and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies. We the people, we the people must redeem the lands, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains and the endless plain, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me and yet I swear this oath that America will be. We will be. We will make America be the place of one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. We will make freedom real. We will make independence real. We will make justice real. We will make lo love real. We will make the beloved community real. Not by hiding, but by telling the truth and standing up in our time and refusing to ever, ever, ever back up. Give us no more bombast. Give us no more hypocrisy. 
to break every chain. Our souls break weary of every chain. Our souls weary of every chain. We want freedom for all people and justice for all people. And we will settle for nothing else. It will not be said on our watch that we didn't have as much courage and as much commitment and as much character as those before us on their watch. As she sings, would you stand as a sign of our commitment? Join hands with somebody as Nancy and I and others retire. There's an army. Cheryl and Yara will send us out of here. And when they finish singing, it'll be time for you can depart from here. But don't let this spirit ever depart from you. As Robin said, the ancestors are stirring. And if you're alive, they're helping to keep you alive just for these times. Doesn't take everybody. It takes a remnant of people who refuse to believe that freedom and justice is impossible. And no matter how brilliant the forces of racism think they are, justice and love is always smarter. Because actually in their arrogance is their fall. Because the scriptures said pride cometh before the fall. God bless you. Sing, sing, Yara, sing. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There's an army
break every chain, 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 to break every chain.